I was actually asked to preach this lesson this morning, and the person who asked me is not here. <laughs> so I've got to record the lesson today. I've got to make sure that's going. Uh, so uh, I, we've, been, we've been kind of doing a, a series of lessons here uh, lately, based, loosely based out of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse, uh, you know, around verse 30 and following what you call the, the Hall of Fame of Faith. And there's some pretty uh, generalized statements uh, in, that, in that passage, especially in uh, verses 32 and 33, uh, about some of the people that the Hebrew writer could have talked about. He, he, he makes some pretty general statements. And one of the big statements that he makes is, the, is those who obtained promises. Um, and that's, that's pretty ge general uh, when you're talking about some of the folks from the Old Testament. And, um, and, and there were a lot of promises that God made to his people um, when, when he gave them the law, uh, you know, he told them that if they remained faithful, they would gain all these blessings. If they, if they uh, turned away from him, they would be cursed. They would have all of these problems that would follow upon them. And, and then he made a promise that if they turned away and they suffered all of these things and, and then they repented and then they turned back and they came back to him, that he would receive them back, that he would welcome them back to him because he is faithful to, to his people. And so he made this promise that if they return to him, that he, he, would, he would restore them, that he would welcome them back as his people again. And so today, I want to talk about the fact that faith returns to God. Now, we've talked about the fact that uh, over the last few weeks that faith waits on God, that faith stands firm, uh, you know, the faith has all of these, these great actions, uh, you know, that puts God in charge, uh, that, that faith follows God's plan, that faith follows through, that faith takes responsibility. But there are times when we falter, and there are times when we stumble, and there are times when we, when we fail, and times when we fall. And just like the, the old cliche says, it's not how many times you fall down that matters, it's how many times you get back up. And that should be a one-for-one one ratio. Every time we stumble, we should get back up. Every time we falter, we should get back up. And every time we fail God, we should return. Every time we depart, we should come back home. And one of the greatest stories in the Bible about this is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 34. If you want to go ahead and turn there, we're going to spend the entire lesson today in, in that in that particular passage. And when you turn there, or Second Chronicles. <laughs> We've been in Second Corinthians so long. <laughs> in Second Chronicles, there is no chapter 34 in Second Corinthians, by the way. I think it tops out about 13. Uh, the Second Chronicles, chapter 34. When you turn there, you're going to recognize the story right away. It's the story of Josiah. And now, Josiah didn't necessarily do anything bad himself, but he does recognize a few things about his people and about his kingdom. So let's go ahead and start talking about the text, because the first thing that we have to understand is that there is a situation going on here. And the situation is serious. And so if you go, let me go ahead and get to here. We're going to look at some of the passages. Um, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but we might get close. So if you go to uh, 2 Chronicles, not Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 34, we read about this guy named Josiah. And looking at verses 1 through 8, we read, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father. He did not turn aside to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the ashram and the carved and metal images. And they chopped down the altars of the Baals and in his presence, and he cut down the incense altars that stood above them. And he broke in pieces the ashram and the carved and metal images, and he made dust of them and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars, cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and in, in their ruins, all around, he broke down the altars and beat the ashram and the images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel. Then he returned. 
to Jerusalem. Well, we see a lot going on here in these first eight verses. We see, first of all, that Josiah becomes king at eight years old. He's a boy. He's a small boy. Uh, barely not a baby anymore. Uh, and, and so when he becomes a king, certainly he is at the, at the disposal of the political powers that be in Jerusalem, and, and, and perhaps they think they're going to push him around, perhaps they think uh, he's going he's to follow their lead, but, but something changes. Something changes as he gets older. In the eighth year of his reign, around the age of 15, 16, 17, the Jews count part of a year as a full year, so you've got about a two-year two year cushion here on the ages, but they seem to be pretty, pretty straightforward here. He begins seeking God at age 16. Still a kid. Now, you ask a 16-year-old, they're not a kid anymore, but you ask a, a 40-something-year-old, a 16-year-old still a kid, right? Uh, and so when, when he begins to mature, when he begins to make that transition from childhood to adulthood, he begins to seek the face of God. Now, one thing that we are missing from the passage here is why. Why does he begin to seek the face of God? Well, he seems to have some indication uh, from his father David, from his great, 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 all the way back grandfather David, that there is a God in heaven who, who needs to be sought after. He needs to be served. Even Paul, when he's talking to, uh, in the New Testament, when he's talking to the Athenians there on Mars Hill, he tells them that God is not far from us. If we just search around, we may find him. So Josiah seems to be seeking, he seems to be searching for God, and he begins purging idolatry at age 20. He's a man now. He's king. He understands that there's something wrong with all of this idolatry because they are supposed to be a kingdom for God. They are supposed to be a nation for God. And he begins purging all of the idolatry at age 20. And then at age 26, he begins restoring, begins restoring the temple. If you look at verse 8, now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land and the house, um, and the house he sent uh, uh, Shaphan, the son of Az Azaliah, and Masia, um, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, to recor the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. So not only was he uh, wanting to purge the land of the idolatry and, and get people away from the wrong things, now he wanted to point people back to the right things. The temple had been abused, it had been neglected, it was in disrepair. The priests weren't actually serving the priesthood anymore. Uh, in fact, many of the priests at this time, if you go and you look at the time of like Nehemiah, even after, after they're carried away into Babylonian captivity, uh, even after that, the, the priests would go and they'd find a plot of land and they'd start farming. And that's not what they were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be in the temple serving God. And so Josiah starts bringing people back to restore the temple and to begin restoring temple worship. As we look a little bit further in verses 8 through 13, again, we just read verse 8. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Masiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. They came to Hilkiah, the high priest, and gave him the money that had been brought into the house of God, which the Levites, the keeper of the threshold, had collected from Manasseh and Ephraim and from all the remnant of Israel and from all Judah and Benjamin and from the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they gave it to the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord. And the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord gave it for repairing and restoring the house. They gave it to the carpenters and the builders to buy quarried stone and tempers uh, and timber for binders and beams for, uh, for the buildings that the kings of Judah had let go to ruin. And the men did the work faithfully. Over them were set uh, Jathan, uh, J Jahath, excuse me, and Obadiah, and the, the Levites, and the sons of Moriah, uh, Mariah, and Zechariah, and Meshulam, the sons of the Kohathites, uh, to have oversight. The Levites, all who were skillful with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and directed all who did work in every kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes and officials and gatekeepers. So we see there's a lot going on here, and the work begins uh, back in the temple. So Josiah sets the workers and the materials in place for repairs to the temple. He's not satisfied because his forefathers had let the temple go to ruin. 
and there was no reason why the house of the Lord should lie in ruin, uh, as some of the previous kings had, had said. Uh, that, and, and the kings live in palaces, in, in great palaces and nice houses. And it's, and it's time to restore the temple. It's time to bring the people back to God and to give them a place to come and to worship God and to offer their sacrifices and to do all of these things. And so these men, men like uh, uh, Shaphan and uh, Messiah, and Joah and Hilkiah began the work. These were good men who needed some leadership. They needed some direction. And here's Josiah who's come back to his knowledge and his understanding that they needed to follow after God. And he sets them back about the work. And the Levites then also returned back to their service. There were many who had been scattered abroad. They had taken on other jobs. They were, they were doing things like uh, uh, being scribes and farming and the gatekeepers and, and all these different things where they were not supposed to be. They were supposed to be at the temple. They were supposed to be serving God, offering up the sacrifices, doing all of these things. But they couldn't because the temple wasn't being supported anymore. Well, now here comes the king who is restoring all of these things back to, way, to the way they should be. We see in verses 14 through 18, while they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Shaphan brought the book to the king and further reported to the king all that was committed to your servants they are doing. They have emptied out the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have given it to the hand of the overseers and workmen. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah, uh, told the, king Hilkiah the priest has given me a book and Shaphan read from it before the king. Now, as we're looking at this here, we have to understand that Josiah up to this point was not working to restore Israel, to restore Judah, because he had read the law. He hadn't had access to it. He hadn't read it. There was no copy of the law to be found at this point in time. It had been left in ruins in the temple. It had been left neglected in the temple. Certainly the kings that had come before Josiah weren't interested in the word of God. They were interested in doing what they wanted to do. And so here's Hilkiah. He goes into the temple. Now, I'm, a little, I'm also a little surprised that Hilkiah discovers a copy of the book of the law. He's supposed to be the high priest. Even if the temple was in ruin, he still would have been in charge of it. He still would have been the one there and, and doing things with it. But he, up to this point, had neglected his job too. And so here he is. Under the direction of the king, they're cleaning out the temple and they come across this book. Hilkiah recognizes it. He knows what it is. I wonder how he felt when he made this discovery. Was he excited? Was he scared? Maybe both? I don't know. But he finds this book and he gives it to Shaphan and he tells Shaphan, go and tell the king of, of what we have found. So this is a book of the, law of, of the law given through Moses, probably something like Deuteronomy, book of the law. The second giving of the law is what Deuteronomy really means. So it's either the, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books, or it's a copy of Deuteronomy. Whatever it is, it's enough where Hilkiah recognizes the story, he recognizes what it is, and he gives it to Shaphan and tells Shaphan, the king's secretary, go give this to the king. Now Shaphan would have been quite literate, probably an expert scribe at this point in time. He would have been the one who would have written any of the orders or the decrees that the king had given. He would have been very personally close to the king. And so he carries it to Josiah, and he reads it to him. This seems to be the very first exposure that Josiah has to an understanding of the law of God. What has he been operating from at this point in time? A, a sense, maybe an innate sense of what's right and what's wrong. Maybe an understanding from who they are or who uh, Israel is supposed to be and, and, and kind of guiding his conscience along as to what is right and what is wrong. 
really kind of a, a proof that there's no real excuse for somebody just behaving badly because they just don't know. We might not know everything. We might not know how God wants us to interact with Him, but, you know, there's, there are times when we just know what's right and we just know what's wrong. But up to this point, that seems to be what was guiding Josiah, unlike his predecessors, who were just doing what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it, trying to please themselves and, and, and please the population. But here's Josiah with a mind to please God. And now here is this man with a mind to please God who is hearing the words of God read before him for perhaps the very first time. And Josiah's reaction is interesting, to say the least. Starting in verse 19 through verse 21, we read, And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Achim the son of Shaphan, Abdon the son of Micah, Shaphan the secretary, and Isaiah the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. Josiah heard the words. And when he heard the words of God proclaimed, he tore his clothes. Now, we don't do that today. <laughs> this was a sign of distress and mourning. This was a sign that he recognized those words as being from God, understood their authority, and then realized how far short they have fallen, personally and nationally. And when he recognized how far short of God's commands he had fallen, it terrified him, and it hurt him. He was upset with his own behavior. He was upset with the behavior of his father. And upset is not a strong enough word. I don't know if there is a strong enough word to, to get across the distress that he felt, to, to get across how, 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 how much he lamented the fact that he had not known and followed God's commands. And so he ripped his clothes, he tore his clothes. And then he sent his people to go inquire of God. He sent his people to go and inquire of God. He wanted all these guys that he had set about this task to go and to find out what God wanted him to know. At the time of the prophets, the time of, of divine revelation, a time when even the high priests were supposed to be those people who were standing in for God, at a time when the prophets were speaking uh, words of, of, of condemnation against people who were turning away from God. Now, now, there was a king who wanted to know. There were other prophets who were proclaiming God's word throughout Israel and throughout Judah at that time, even before Josiah came around, and the kings had ignored them. And even later, once you have prophets like Jeremiah speaking, the kings not only ignored them, they wanted to do away with the prophets because they didn't want to hear God's word. But Josiah, Josiah did. Why? Because Josiah recognized that they, Israel, had not obeyed the commands of the Lord. I've recognized, he says, that we have fallen short. Not only have we fallen short by a little bit, we as a nation have abandoned God wholesale. And I need to know, what's God going to do? Because I see in his word, he tells us if we follow him, we'll be blessed. But if we abandon him, we'll be cursed. I need to know what's going to happen. How's this going to end? So we see a prophecy. 
fairly lengthy prophecy here. And we see in verse 22 that Hilkiah and those the king had sent, they went to Huldah, the prophetess. Now we talked about Deborah just uh, not too long ago, another prophetess, one of uh, the five that are mentioned in the Bible. We've covered two of them in a couple of weeks. They went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shul, uh, Shalom, the son of Tokath, the son of Harash, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter and spoke to her to that effect. And she said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who, who, you, sent, tell the man who sent you to me. Thus says the Lord. The first part of this message had to be terrifying to hear them, for them to hear. Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book that was read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and had made offerings to other gods that they might provoke me to anger um, with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. Now, if she had stopped there, that would be bad. What do you do after that? God's wrath is going to be poured out against me as I got nothing. But, verse 26, to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants. And you have humbled yourself before me, and, you've, you, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place and its inhabitants. And they brought back word to the king. Josiah's servants... Go back to Huldah, or go to Huldah, the prophetess, and speak to her, as we just read. Because he returned, she prophesies that Josiah's generation would have peace. Because they returned, they were going to have peace. This is a mixed bag for Josiah. Imagine somebody coming to you and saying, you know what, you're not going to have any more trouble the rest of your life. You're not going to have any more problems. Everything's going to be okay. It's going to be peaceful because you have turned to God. It's going to be peaceful and, and you're going to leave this life and you're going to go into the next and from now until then everything will be fine. But the people that come after you, I'm going to destroy them. The people that come after you are going to leave me. They're going to turn aside from me. They're not going to listen to my words. And they're going to be destroyed. Any following generation from you you want to see that happen to? But you, Josiah, you've turned back toward me. And because you have turned back toward me, you're going to have peace, at least for a little while. And that means something. That means something about us turning back to God. That means something for now. But the future generations, Josiah, they're, they're not going to do what you've done. We're always, I always hear it said, the church is one generation away from apostasy. Israel was literally one generation away from apostasy and destruction. And even after this, if you go and you look at the chronology of everything that happened, even after this, God continued to send prophets to Judah and to Jerusalem and to warn them about the impending doom, but they wouldn't listen. 
even before Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon came in and steamrolled all the way through, through Jerusalem, even Jeremiah was sent to say, look, just, just s turn yourself over, surrender the kingdom to them, and we'll have peace. But the people wouldn't do it. Josiah, you'll be okay. Your future generations, however, will suffer their own consequences. Look at why Josiah returned to God. Look at these things. We know Josiah did reign for 31 years. Several more years after we've read here where he got started. And at least that generation had peace. And at least Josiah was able to be gathered up, as the prophet has said, and, return, and, and buried with his fathers in peace. And Josiah, we see, stands as a shining example of what it means to return to God. And if future generations had followed his example, if future generations had listened to God, they could have had that same peace. Why did Josiah return? Look at what it took. The first thing we see is Josiah had to admit wrong. Personally, nationally, even though he thought he was doing everything he should, he recognized when he heard God's word that he was wrong. That's hard to do. And with some people it's impossible. They just don't want to admit they're wrong. Oh no, I'm, everything's okay over here, I'm fine. I'm not doing anything wrong. Uh, Josiah, he recognized it. Man, we've missed the mark. We have fallen short. We are in sin. We have abandoned this covenant. And then he had to break with the current traditions. He had to say, I'm not going to do what my father did. I'm not going to do what my grandfather did. I'm not going to do what my great-grandfather did. Man, not only was Josiah admitting he was wrong, he was admitting his people were wrong. We don't want to do that either. We want to follow our family traditions. We want to follow the customs of our community. We want, to, we want to hold on to what we've been doing. Because if it worked for so and so, it's got to work for me. What's well, that? Uh, I can't remember exactly that song, Old Time Religion. If it was good enough for Grandma, it's good enough for me. What if Grandma was wrong? Josiah had to get out of his comfort zone. I wonder how much opposition Josiah faced when he started cutting down the ashram and taking, the, uh, taking their altars and grinding them to dust and burning them up and scattering them over the graves of those who had made sacrifices to Baal. You remember what happened when Gideon did that, right? The people of the community came and, and threatened to kill him and uh, Gideon's father said... Uh, Hey, if you think Baal's upset, let Baal fight for himself. And Gideon was renamed Jerubbabel. <laughs> Josiah, we don't read about him having that type of opposition, but he had to get out of being comfortable. And especially as a kid, especially as a young man, he's making these reforms. Man, I'm sure he got some opposition. But he had to get away from what was comfortable and what everybody accepted. And he had to humble himself before God. God gives grace to the humble, we're told. Humble yourself before God and He will exalt you. Josiah, even though he was king, had to recognize he was not in charge. God is the one who is in charge. And once we recognize God is the one who is in charge, and it's not me, a lot of things can change. A lot of things can get better. A lot, of, a lot of differences can be made. But I have to make sure I am humble enough before God that I can listen to His commands. We have a tendency to have this you ain't the boss of me attitude. It's not just a teenager thing, even though it seems to affect teenagers disproportionately. We have this, you're not the boss of me attitude. 
Uh, you can't tell me what to do. Well, if somebody's in a position of authority, they have the right to tell you what to do. They have the responsibility to tell you what to do. And so if you have to obey an earthly authority, what about a heavenly authority? We need to humble ourselves enough to where we listen to the commands of God and we act accordingly. Not only do we listen, but we respond properly. This is what Josiah had to do in order to return to God. And God was ready and he was willing to allow him to do so. He was ready for his child to come home. He was ready for this prodigal nation to, to give up their idolatry, to give up uh, all of the things of the world that they were pursuing and to return to him. So what does this mean for us today? What does this mean for us today in our return to God? Some of us are right there next to him. Some of us may be far off. And in every one of our lives, we've been somewhere between the two. I promise. If you've not been somewhere between the two, you've not lived long enough. Or you're not recognizing what you've been through. But when we return to God, there are some things that we have to do. First, we must have a heart to serve God. You look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, when Paul talks about what the Macedonians were able to give back to God, and Paul was amazed, but he understood that first they had given themselves to God, they had given their hearts to God. It's the first thing that we have to do. If my heart still belongs to the world, if God is still not my master, if I'm trying to serve sin, if I'm trying to serve self, if I'm trying to serve the world, then I'm not going to serve God. My heart doesn't belong to Him. I have to give Him my heart first. Second, when we see that we fall short of God's will, we must be willing to change. If I'm not willing to change... I'm going to be stuck. Change hurts. Change is painful. Change is hard. It is difficult. It is not easy. Can I explain it any other way? But it is something that we have to do. When we recognize how bad staying the same is, that will help us to overcome the difficulty in making the changes we need to make. And when we recognize we have changes we need to make and we're ready to make them, we have to know and, and, and rely on the fact that we're not doing it on our own. A God who loves us has sent us people who love us and the help that we need in order to make those changes happen. He has given us everything we need to turn our lives around if we just seek Him. We have to be willing to make those changes regardless of how painful they may be. Does that mean I have to give up the family tradition? Yes. Does that mean I have to admit that I'm wrong? Yes. Does that mean I have to turn my back on, on the things that I've enjoyed in life, the things I've done in life? Yes. Does that mean I have to, I have to shrug off the, the culture that's around me? Oh, yes. Does that mean I have to give up those sins that have brought me so much pleasure? Yes. Once I recognize how good God is for me and how good God is to me, and I see how bad sin is, and I see the problems that it brings, these changes should be easier. If we want to return to God, if we want to access His promises, He is there, and He is ready, and He is waiting on us. Just like in the story that Jesus told of the prodigal son, when the son took his portion of the inheritance and he ran away, he blew it all, wine, women, and song, I guess is the, the best way you could phrase that. 
And then he wound up in the depths of sin, the depths of despair, a, a nice Jewish boy sitting in a pig pen wanting to eat pig food. That's pretty good. Man, I wish I had some of that pig food. And then he realized, man, there's so much extra bread in my father's house. Maybe he'll hire me back. And, and, and the prodigal son said to himself, here's what I'm going to do because I know I'm wrong. I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to tell my father, Father, I have sinned before you and before the eyes of God. And, and if you will take me back and just put me in your house as a hired servant, I'll come back. His heart was turned back toward his father. His attitude had become humble. He was desiring to go home. He didn't even want to be back in the house as a son. He was fine just being one of the servants. But our father is like that father who is looking for that son. And as that prodigal son took the turn down the road going back to his father's house, the father was watching for him because he saw him, not as he was approaching the gate, but he saw him from far off. And he ran to meet the son, and the son started to, to give his speech. He started to say, Father, I've sinned before you, and in the eyes of God, and, if, and the father said, Welcome home. Because the son's heart was right, his attitude was right, and he desired to come home. If you're here today, and you find yourself far off from God, and you're ready to, to go home. You're ready to join him. You're ready to be back in his kingdom. You have an opportunity to repent of sin again. Because once you are a child of God, God has said if you, if you fall into sin again and, and you confess that sin, that, that he is righteous and he is faithful and he will forgive you again. If you're here today and you're not yet a child of God, and you recognize how bad sin is, and you recognize how good God is, and you're ready to come to Him, to be part of His kingdom, to be part of His household, to, to claim Him as your Lord, you can do that today as well. And you can return back to the God who gave you life. So if you're here this morning, and you have either spiritual need, if you need to repent as an erring child of God, as that, that prodigal son almost, or if you need to be baptized to have your sins washed away, for the very first time, won't you come and let that need be made known as together we stand and sing our invitation song.